So this was one big ass pleasant surprise for me. Summer of 84 was released today on Amazon. Uh, well, plenty of platforms to rent, I'm sure, but Amazon is what I rented it on. But it was available for VOD, should I say. Um, I saw a trailer to this a couple months ago. I did a trailer reaction on here. Um, I had seen the poster work. I had heard rumblings of it from friends, stuff like that. Um, when I saw the trailer, I was very on board. I, I was looking forward to this and just kind of waiting for it to get dropped. Um, it was released in limited theaters and I just thought it would be a while before we saw a Blu-ray or a VOD or whatever and nope, it was on there thanks to uh, Keen Gross or Travis Gillespie, whoever you want to give credit to there, <laughs> for bringing it to my attention and telling me that it was available. So I got to throw this on and my fucking God, did I love this film so much. I think this would easily sneak into my top five right now of the year. And I have a lot of movies in this year that I've loved. So, you know, this is an 80s throwback. I know a lot of people are kind of getting tired of that shtick. Um, you know, you had a lot of it kind of with like the Kung Fury and the Turbo Kid and then It and Stranger Things kind of have more popularized it into like mainstream. But being such a huge fan of the 80s and 80s slashers and all that kind of stuff because this 80s is my gen not only my generation but also, you know, the films I gravitate towards the most. Probably a lot of nostalgia centering around that but at the same time I do love it I can't deny that I don't know if I want to give all the credit to nostalgia I don't think so because I love those kinds of movies all the fucking 80s stuff uh, that's my favorite era for film definitely and so this film is set in 1984 as you can guess by the title um, and it is it's very reminiscent of Stranger Things or It I mean take your pick it's four friends Four guy friends um, who are, you know, out there. They're just being kids. They're they're like 14 years old. So very very similar um, as far as like the cast goes. Uh, you got the you've got the fat kid, and you've got the rebel kid, and you've got the main kid, and you've got the geeky kid. And then there's the hot girl they're all fawning over and you know it's typical for this kind of thing but man did the chemistry between these kids work for me so well they just felt like kids of the 80s they felt like how i was when i was a kid at this age now at this age i was in the 90s but i mean at this age all you talk about is sex women your mom jokes like and they nailed that part of the movie. They nailed the 80s feel. The music in this is incredible. It is fantastic. And, I mean, I can't say enough good about this film. So, uh, if you're a fan of that type of film, if you're a big fan of the 80s throwback, or just 80s films in general, and you loved It, and you love Stranger Things, and you love Turbo Kid, and you love those kinds of throwbacks, absolutely watch this thing now these kids are in the summer of 1984 they're out playing around they're playing this game called manhunt and uh, there's all these kids in town that are going missing there's been 13 kids now that are confirmed to be dead and, and they think are the work of this serial killer and the main kid here Davey um, starts to suspect that his neighbor might be responsible and his neighbor is a cop. Um, and, you know, it's just kind of back and forth. You don't know. You know, It's so good. It's a murder mystery, but it's also like a coming-of-age 80s throwback. Right there. You're good to go, right? So I sold you on the film, I hope, if you're into those kinds of things. If you're not, ditch it. But, I, Wow was I crazy about this? I mean, I know I'm kind of being repetitive, but oh, so good. Um, all the cast was like on point. You know, they all nailed their roles so well. There wasn't anybody that stuck out as miscast or, or kind of bogging the film down or anything. Everyone worked so well together. Um, but yeah, so anyways, check it out. 
Uh, you can rent it on like iTunes and all the different VOD platforms, I'm sure. But I got it on Amazon, so I can definitely assure you it's there. Um, but so I want to move into spoilers because I don't really do. I don't really like doing uh, spoiler-free reviews. <laughs> I like talking about shit. So here we go, guys. My spoiler review, which I'm going to do right now. Spoilers. In case someone's not listening, I get shit for this all the time. They're like, man, I was in my kitchen and then like it moved in and you were talking about spoilers and spoilers. All right, so let's talk about the film for those of you who have watched it. Um, so this takes place in Ipswich, Oregon. Uh, I'd already gushed about the music enough. Um, so we got this guy here from Mad Men and uh, his name is uh, Officer Mackey. And he asks Davy, this main kid here, uh, to help him move something into his house when Davy's there as the paper boy on his little paper route uh, to move something inside of his house with him. Uh, very Buffalo Bill thing to do. Now, this was interesting because now that I can talk spoilers, I, throughout the movie, it's this murder mystery, and Davy is so set on Mackie and throughout the whole film they're making him this like blatant red hair and I'm thinking okay they're not like I, I was so like back and forth on are they going to make him the killer or are they not going to make him the killer and it kept making me just go like every five seconds I thought I had to figure it out now I did think that Nikki was the killer for like over half the film. I just kept being like, no, it's her, it's her. You know, even at the end, like when they find the body and everything in his house and all that, I was like, yeah, maybe Nikki planned it. I was so dead set in my ways. I, I was not letting it go. Um, but that really all kind of, and, and I was kind of bummed a little bit that he was the killer. I actually kind of thought it would be really cool if, you know, at the end, he just finds out that he wasn't, he gets caught by him, and, you know, it's just a total waste, like, he fucked his life up, like, whatever, like, I thought, like, the way it could play out is he broke into his house to see if he was the killer, and then Mackie would have came in the house, and he would have killed him, like, accidentally or something, and they would have found out he didn't do anything, and then the kid, like, went to jail or something, it would be a really fucked up ending, but making the killer... I was fine with it because of how it all ended, like the way it ended. First, when they said he was the killer, I was like, uh, I don't know, that's so obvious and it's so convenient, it's so like this and that. But at the same time, as it, as it ended, I'll get into that in a minute, but let's continue to go with this. Um, so he, they're playing this manhunt game and he looks through his window and he sees um, this kid that he'll later see on a milk carton. Uh, as the missing kid and uh, later he also finds his shirt with like a hole in it and blood on it this guy is a cop and he's this dumb like he's got a lot of things that I, throughout this movie and and probably the biggest one is keeping the pictures of the kids that he's killed on his wall in his main living area where like his friends probably come over he's a pol you know he's he's a fucking cop of course he's going to have cop buddies come over. And they're not going to be like, I recognize these pictures. These are the kids from the fucking murders. Why do you have these guys on your wall? These aren't you. So I just, I, it played for a cool moment. Like, oh my God, all these pictures I, on the wall I thought were his family are actually the families of the people he killed. But these are cops that are, you know, going over the paperwork over and over and looking through the files and whatever. They're going to recognize those fucking kids. Okay? So, if, if this kid recognized them just off of fucking melt cartons, tr trust me, he's going to recognize. But this guy's out of his mind, so who knows. Um, anyway. <clears throat> so, his friend thinks that he's nuts. Oh, shit, I forgot. Uh, I used to collect weekly world news. I was really into that magazine. I thought it was hilarious. I bought it every year. I had the last issue they ever did, the collector's edition. 
Um, I have a I have a ton of them, but I, that was my favorite. They, you know, that was a big one to me because it was like, no, why is this out? I bought it every single week, and I'd read through the whole things, kittens on the Titanic, and Bat Boy, and all that stuff. So I love that. And so seeing this kid being really into tabloids and then being plastered up all on the walls, and then to find out that uh, Nikki used to babysit him and she got him into that magazine she's like oh my god you still collect these when he comes over to his house so she, you know and i get that there's things that girls have done for me in the past when i was a young kid it's very impressionable and i still do some of those things to this day i mean my type is still this chick my dad hired once upon a time and she kind of became the archetype for the kind of chick i was into pretty much all of my life since that day so you know, these girls can have such a lasting effect on you that you don't know. So I liked all that. It was kind of bringing me back. <sighs> um, a lot of your mom jokes here. <laughs> the, 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 the kid here, um, Tommy, the rebel, he has so many hilarious your mom jokes to Woody. Oh my God, they were killing me. Every single one of them hit. Your mom jokes just never get old. They're classics, man. They never go out of style. They're so good. They're so easy. Don't get me wrong, because I I really really love and respect comedy, and it's something I take seriously. You can't really take comedy serious, but it's something that I I really really adore. And I, I hate cheap humor, like like mocking and stuff like that. That's not funny. When somebody when you say something and then somebody says exactly what you say back in some kind of dumb voice. Nye, nye, nye and people laugh, that's not funny, okay? That's not fucking funny, I just want people to know that. That is the lowest form of comedy ever. <laughs> so, I hate that shit. But, I don't know, your mom jokes, as easy as they are, they can be so clever. It's just the right moment is what it's all about. It's the timing of your mom jokes. Okay, I'm gonna get off your mom jokes, but they're, <laughs> but I'm not gonna get off your mom. Um. So, let's see. Um, they like to communicate through their walkies. It's before cell phones, people. I, mean, I remember these times. Uh, I don't know how their walkies are always on all night. They just keep the batteries constantly changing out. Like they keep them on for days at a time. Uh, maybe these kinds of walkies have like some kind of low grade setting or they, I don't know. I don't know. They, I always see that in movies and I'm like, they have to be on for that to happen. And they'd be like, you know, the whole time there'd be the static from it. So I don't know. That never made any sense to me. But maybe I'm wrong. Maybe maybe some radios do something that I'm unaware of. So please correct me if I'm wrong. As I said, all they talk about is sex. I mean, they couldn't be more accurate about these kids' age. Um, maybe maybe me and my friends are fucking weird. But uh, to my knowledge, all 15 year olds talk about is sex and and wanting to have sex and all the shit that they're doing and pretending that they're doing and uh you know when they're talking about getting on base and you know i i i kind of did like i kind of got to third bra or like i rounded third base something whatever the hell he says and he's like oh man i just like to get to first base all that conversation it's so great because it's just so realistic and as i said the kids in this movie they're just their chemistry, the way that they talk to each other, all that, it worked so well. I think it is as good as Stranger Things or It for that, you know, specific thing. Like, I'd put this up there with with It as just as, as riveting for me, like as, as entertaining, as I liked it pretty much just as much. So, yeah, that's a huge praise. Um, and let's see. Um, the kid wants to be a filmmaker, you know, Davey here, uh, which it kind of reminds me of how when Stephen King writes, uh, he always has a writer in his story. Almost every damn King novel I've read, one of the central characters in his book is a writer because he writes what he knows sometimes and writers is his comfort area. So when I, when I see people who are writing characters as filmmakers to be kids as that want to be filmmakers it's just you know it always works for me because i'm just like i get it like <laughs> you write what you know right and 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 we all dream about being filmmakers as young kids um i don't think many people grow up and then like when they're 25 or something they're like 
you know, I've never thought about this before, but I'd like to be a filmmaker and then go make movies. That's, you know, we grow up wanting to make films. So it's so easy to write about a kid who wants to be a filmmaker because you were that kid. So anytime I see that, I just liked that here. Um, and um, let's see. I, I find it interesting that Davy and I get this. This is this is such a kid thing to do because you're not really thinking about um, how fucked up this may be. But when they find out there's a serial killer in town, he thinks it's awesome. He's like, "This is so cool, and this is the greatest thing that's ever happened." And finally, something's happening here. And it's like, thirteen boys are dead. You live in this town, and you are in the age range that fits his mo. Like, you think this is cool? Wow, like he's just not thinking this out, but he's so bored in his town. He thinks this is, you know, and he's so into conspiracies and he's so into, you know, these stories that he reads in these magazines that he just thinks he's going to, you know, this is going to be some fun thing. And of course, it ends up not being fun for him at all. <sighs> I love that Tommy steals an, a National Geographic's magazine because there's naked chicks in those from different countries and he's like free porn. That's great. Pictures on milk cartons, man. There's something you can't like. You can't know unless you were a kid of the '80s. I mean, I remember that. You buy a milk carton, there'd be kids on the side of it that were missing. It was fucking depressing. You're sitting there, you're eating your cereal, and you're looking at some kid who's probably getting fucking raped in Tijuana or something. It's horrendous. Although I probably didn't think of that at the time, so I'm you know kind of jading my memory right now. But I did get depressed as a child um, when I when we could afford to actually eat. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's see. Uh, I like their stakeout montage. That was pretty cool. You gotta have. You can't have an '80s film without a montage. So they're kind of setting up their set, uh, stakeout, <clears throat> and they're arguing over Ewoks in in Star Wars. I thought that was pretty great. Um, and we find out that Woody's mom is an alcoholic, and that's why he's getting real hard on Tommy for making all these mom jokes. Uh, which was kind of sad, especially since Woody ends up fucking dying. Um, and Nikki just shows up to Davy's house in the middle of the night at like midnight. And you can tell this was written by a guy in his fantasies. Um, and my God, Nikki is a uh, fucking adorable. I had to like, as soon as it came on, I saw her. I was like, okay, that chick's hot. I got to make sure she's, you know, of age. And she's like 23. So we're good. Um, but Jesus Christ, she's, she's a beautiful woman. Um, but yeah, she comes over, she's like flirting with him and then the mom comes and fucks up his chance and, and she sneaks out the window. Uh, that was kind of when I started thinking she was the killer. Um, and then they get in the car, all four of them are in the car and they're driving and they're trying to follow this guy and then a cop pulls him over and the cop is so fucking nice. But Tommy's kind of the rebel around town. He's the delinquent, the uh, kid who's always in trouble. So they're kind of having a moment with each other, but ultimately it lets them go. I was like, oh man, that'd be terrifying. Um, Nikki's parents are slitting up, which creates a little drama. And I, it kind of added to my like, okay, you know, I think they were trying to make it look like it could possibly her, be her for sure. But I, I kind of fell for it. Cause I just kept thinking like, no, it's just going to kind of come out of nowhere. It's going to be a babysitter kind of thing, but no. And she is a babysitter, right? Um, and we get to see their first drinking experience, which my first drinking experience was awful. Okay, just in case, for some reason, I have some fans out there who are watching this, or not even fans, so somebody who's watching this, um, who is never drank before, or is young, or maybe older, and still hasn't drank, and you go to drink, let me tell you something right now. It's in pertinent information, okay? So just store it up here, write it down, whatever you got to do. Alcohol takes a little while before it hits you. So when you drink it, it's not instantaneous like you would think as a kid. So when I drank my first drink, I was like, I don't feel anything. I'm going to take another. I don't feel anything. I'm going to take another. And I'm like, what is fucking everyone's big deal about this shit? I don't feel anything. What the hell's going on? Six drinks later, I'm like, I think I feel something. Oh, okay, this is kind of cool. All right, maybe I'll drink another. Two drinks later, I'm like really feeling something. I'm like, all right, see, it just took a lot. I'm a heavyweight. Oh, yeah. 
The only heavy weight there was was in my fucking backyard as I was vomiting out of my window from the second story, yelling down at my Siberian Husky, Kimba, no, don't eat my vomit. And then my friend laying outside my bedroom door, knocking, saying that he tried to masturbate but couldn't get it up and fell asleep on my floor in front of my door. I fell asleep in my fucking bedroom, woke up to my stepfather with a squirt gun blasting me in the face and my friend still passed out on the fucking carpet right there in front of us. Then he took us to like uh, this pizza place and he did donuts and circles in the parking lot and I swore, I swore he had to know. How could he not? We were vomiting in the bathroom. We were trying to play cool like we didn't fucking throw up and we weren't drinking that night before and everything. And then I asked him years later, I was like, dude, like admit it. And he's like, I swear to God, I didn't know. It just coincidentally wanted to take you guys out and do really fucking crazy shit. And I was like, that was the worst day for you to be a fun person, you piece of shit. <laughs> yeah. All right, so I told you that story for way longer than I should have. But yeah, take note, people. Take fucking note. Um, Where am I? Playing Manhunt. Oh, I played a very similar game called sardines where everyone hides out and then when one person comes in they find somebody then that person takes that person and they go look for everyone else and then a whole group of you is looking for that last person oh man i used to have the most amazing hiding spots no one could ever fucking find me um they're still looking i think uh been in my garage this whole time uh friends let's see uh, friends go with him against their better judgment the second time uh, because um, Mackie, uh, the dad, forces uh, his kid to go over uh, Davy and all of the friends and make him go over to, over to Mackie's house and be like, I'm sorry, we thought you were a killer and this and that and confront him right there and apologize, which must have sucked because they think he's, you know, I think he's a killer and they don't want to go over there but that scares the friends and then Mackie comes over to his house and he's so cool about everything and then he's like can you call the nephew like so I can talk whatever and he's like yeah sure can I come in the house and then he goes and he grabs the phone he grabs a knife brings it back to him he steps inside the house gives him the phone he dials the number it rings he hangs it up Mackie leaves he goes he checks the number he writes it that was a really cool moment by the way when he writes it on that little uh you know, dry erase board or whatever, and their Mackie's numbers right below because they have like a friends list there. That was really smart. That was a cool way to do it without having to be like, oh my God, that's Mackie's number. I know that now. Like to not say anything just for our eyes to kind of figure it out. That was really, really cool. And that whole fucking scene was tense as shit. I just kept thinking Mackie's going to jump on him at any moment because as soon as he called back, the number, whatever, when he called the operator, he's like, what, what's the last number? She's, you know, she gives it, it's Mackie's number. I was like, oh, that motherfucker's guilty. Like, there's no reason that he would do that otherwise. Um, so I'm glad that Davey stuck to his guns, because after that shit, oh, hell no. <sighs> um, and as I said, the friends go with him, and then they go in the basement, and that's another tense-ass scene, and they find the body in the tub. As I said, I was still kind of like, maybe it's the chick, but I, you know, after the phone call, I was like, how could that be anything but Mackie? Uh, you got the kid chained up down there, like in martyrs. Um, and then the parents are kind of stunned after. I was really surprised that they got the footage to the cops. Holy shit, I was really surprised by that because I thought he was going to be in the house for sure, but nope, there he was. Um, and. Then I found it really weird that, you know, he comes home and they're like, well, we got him. And they like give each other high fives and the parents are like, you know, good job. We're proud of you. Whatever. Go to bed. This guy's on the loose still. Like, what the fuck? So I found that to be a little ridiculous. Like, this killer's still on the loose. You, like, they know he knew. Like, so... I don't know. I was just like, yeah, I think you probably should be a little more worried than you than you are. But 
they didn't give a shit. And so he takes him, and I love that he was hiding up in their attic the whole time. I thought that was great. The calls are coming from inside the house. That was great. Um, and then the, uh, they wake up, and they're out in the woods, and then Woody gets killed. That was really sad. And they find the big pile of bodies. Uh, Woody gets his throat slit. And then, man, the most fucked up scene. This is what I was talking about. This is what redeemed that ending for me. Like, it, from him being the killer, kind of conveniently, was when he comes up to him and he holds him up and he's just like, you know, I'm not going to kill you right now. I'm going to kill you one day. One day I'm coming back for you. And you're going to be looking over your shoulder. You're going to think every single day of your life is your last you ruined my life. Now I'm ruining your fucking life. I just thought that was evil as fuck. <laughs> I mean, he probably could have got captured like 20 minutes later, but he, I, I, he didn't, I mean, at that point. But to live with that knowledge as a kid, like... When I was, oh my God, as soon as that happened, shit, man, I'd be trained, I'd be out of there. I'd be the fuck out of there. I'd move, and then I'd go, and I'd do some serious training. Like, no shit. And I would fucking try to hunt this guy down and kill him. And then I'd try to get back to my life. <laughs> but to live with that knowledge that there's this killer who's out there, and you fucked him up, and all this, and he killed your friend, and you know what he's capable of, and all that stuff, and, he, and the cops can't find him, and... Ooh, the weight of that crushing on you every single day and then no one's on his side at the end like he goes out and his little girlfriend's just driving away his friends won't even look at him everything's all closed down like there's police tape everywhere he's out on his bike he's riding around he's got no protection no friends no nothing Whew, that kid's life sucks he really did ruin his fucking life so I thought that was a really, really bold and dark ending, and I appreciated the shit out of it. So this movie is like near perfection for me. I adored the hell out of it. So anyways, what do you guys think? If you're still here, you can disagree with everything I said. You're still wrong. I'm just kidding. <laughs> All right.